We move now then into chapter 20. So chapter 20 is perhaps one of the most complex and debated passages of Revelation, uh, which says a lot because we've already seen a lot of debated and complex passages, and this one probably rates at the highest, and it has a lot to do with this issue of the thousand years and what the thousand years represents and when it's going to take place and what's going to take place before it and what's going to take place after it. Let's go ahead and uh, take the time to read it first, get the entirety of it, um, and then uh, we'll pick up and, and look at the parts individually. Um, if somebody would read verses 1 through 8 and then somebody else 9 through 15. 1 through 8 and 9 through 15. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them with robes to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received his mark on the forehead from their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such that the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will remain in the for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, and will come out to the sleeping nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Rog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So we have a lot of different symbols and a lot of different numbers here. Uh, and, you know, first death, second death, first resurrection, all sorts of things flying around here. And, of course, with the thousand years uh, intertwined in all of this. And so it becomes a very complex passage uh, based on um, a variety of things and how different people are interpreting it. We'll talk, get to some of that here in a little bit. But let's try and work our way through here and see if we can at least come to some understanding of at least some of this as we're going through. First part should be easy. <laughs> John sees an angel coming down from heaven. All right, got that. And I understand what's going on there. We've seen, of course, uh, you know, angels coming down from heaven, uh, delivering messages. Right, chapter 10, of course, uh, you know, there's the seven thunders that thunder when the mighty angel uh, speaks a variety of other things that we've seen angels doing. Well, here we have another angel coming down from heaven, but in this case, uh, it is simply, or it is not simply, but the purpose of this angel um, has to do with the punishment of the dragon, of Satan. The angel coming down from heaven uh, has in his hand the key to the bottomless pit, or to the abyss. Now, the last time... Uh, we had seen someone with a key and the abyss, it was with the fifth trumpet. And the angel who then let the locusts out of the bottomless pit, excuse me, uh, the star letting the locusts out of the bo uh, bottomless pit. And so in that case, 
the key was to open the bottomless pit. In this case, the key is to close it. With the key, this angel carries a great chain. So, what's this angel coming to do? He's coming to imprison something. Well, and particularly, of course, as we know, he's coming to imprison the dragon. And so, the theme here is in imprisonment. And so, he's not just going to be locked in a jail cell. And the image is probably that of shackles, right? He's going to be, he's going to be chained within that cell as well. So, another level of imprisonment. The angel, of course, is coming to take the dragon. Now, maybe I'm making too much of this next comment. But the being that takes hold of the dragon is simply called an angel. We've seen in other places mighty angels. And so there have been times when John has wanted to emphasize, I saw a mighty angel. This guy's just an angel. And just an angel is all it takes to grab that dragon by his throat and imprison him. And so, again, maybe I'm making too much of it, but it's just an angel. Right? Of course, just an angel is, you know, certainly above our physical capabilities, but it, I think, suggests something of the comparative strength and power between an angel and a mission from God and Satan. And of course, in case we had forgotten, since chapter 12, John again reminds us that the dragon is symbolic for Satan. Not only Satan, the accuser, um, he's also that ancient serpent, meaning to think back to Genesis chapter 3 and the serpent that tempts Adam and Eve. So here is the enemy of God, the enemy of human beings, being imprisoned. And his imprisonment is going to be for a thousand years. So he's going to be bound for a thousand years. And here, too, we have to remember, right, I'm stressing this uh, you know, all the time, about this symbolic imagery. And, of course, the context of this symbol is, is a prison. What does it mean to bind Satan? Does this mean that, that Satan has been or will be physically locked in some place? I've got some heads that are nodding, some heads that are shaking. Well, Perhaps, or perhaps not. If we take this as symbolic, that the bind, it says binding, but it means something else, what would it mean to bind Satan? If Satan is bound in a symbolic sense, what, what would that mean? Like you need power to restrict him to Yeah, it probably refer, would be some sort of restriction. Which then would cause us to ask, in a sense, hasn't Satan always been restricted? Has Satan ever had the right to do whatever he wants? No. He's always been asked the whatever God allows him to do. A couple passages to think of. Um, think of uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Somebody uh, get that, please. Colossians 2 and verse 15. Right, and so in the cross, there is this, this conquering of, of, of Satan, a recognition of the restrictions that, that, that Satan had. Um, Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, it's probably a, a better one with this idea of binding and restriction. Um, Matthew chapter 12, um, 
uh, let's say 27 through 29. Matthew 12, 27 through 29. And if I drive out demons by the visible, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your um, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. For again, how can anyone enter a strong strong man's house and carry out his possessions unless he first has a, a strong man? Right. So the context here is um, is Jesus casting out demons and the Jewish leader saying, uh, you know, he's casting out demons by the prince of demons. Jesus' whole point is if Satan goes against himself, it's going to lead to his destruction. It's not going to be success. And so he, he talks about that right, as, as evidence of the kingdom of God coming. But then he goes on to say, if you go to a strong man's house and want to steal his stuff, what do you got to do? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta get past it, and you gotta tie him up, and that's what he's doing. So who's the strong man that Jesus is tied up? It's Satan, right? So the casting out of demons, Jesus says, is my binding of the strong man. Right? So Satan is being bound by Jesus' power. But ultimately, I think of the the clearest uh, example from the Bible of this idea of restricting Satan is probably the Book of Job. If you think of those first two chapters of the book of Job, here comes Satan appearing before God. And God asks him, have you considered my servant Job? Right? And talks about Job's integrity and Job's faithfulness. And Satan says, well, sure, if you're going to protect him. And God says, right, you can take all he has, but you can't touch him. Right? A restriction. Right? You can destroy everything he has, but you can't touch Job. The second time, right, God says, right, you can hurt him physically, but you can't take his body. And so in a sense, we can say, Satan has always been bound, restricted, by what God would allow him to do. Martin Luther put it this way, the devil is God's devil. He can only do what God allows him to do. And so Satan, in a sense, has always been bound. So this binding is a distinct binding that would be different than the binding that would apply in other situations. Now, he's going to be bound for a thousand years. So limited, restricted. Now, we'll discuss the thousand year bit in a little bit because the... I think the, the thousand year imprisonment and the thousand year reign refer to the same time period, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So we'll hold off on the thousand years and, and talk about that in a couple minutes. After he's bound, he's thrown into the pit. The, the pit is locked, and it is sealed. Satan is imprisoned. He cannot escape. And the idea here is he's sealed in the pit, much like the 144,000 were sealed on their foreheads, right? There's a, a permanency. Uh, you know, he's not getting out. It's not just locked, it's sealed. So he's bound, he's locked, and sealed. But for what purpose? Or what is he bound with respect to? So that he would deceive the nations no more. And here appears to be the specific way Satan is bound. He cannot deceive the nations as before, right? using this coalition of nations, this empire, to do his work, this beast. So I don't think this means that during this thousand year period, whenever it is, that it means Satan is not active at all. Instead, he was restricted from deceiving the nations like he did through the two beasts. Until that is, the thousand years is ended. Right? The binding lasts for a thousand years. And so for this time period, he's prevented from deceiving the nations. Now, I don't think that means he's bound from deceiving but he's, not, he's bound from not deceiving the nations 
in the way that he has been through the book of Revelation. After that thousand years, though, he must be let out for a little while. So if the binding here, if, I, if I'm right, the binding here refers to him being limited from deceiving the nations. Then after the thousand years, he will be loosed from that binding. Which kind of suggests the idea that he will be allowed to try again, in a sense. But this second time to try and deceive the nations is but a little time. He'll be let out for a little time, which will be picked up later on in the chapter and what happens during the little time. 